Would you like to hear about the craziest rural surveillance I ever had? If you said yes, then this video is for you. Welcome to the PI Guy Tips, Tricks, and Advice for Professional Private Investigators just like you. My name is John Morris. I'm a licensed professional private investigator in Colorado. Now, you probably already know that I do a lot of rural surveillance. Given where my business is located up here in northern Colorado, it just goes with the territory. Now, don't get me wrong. City, suburban, and metro surveillance comes around as well. My company, Epco Investigations, covers much of the Colorado Front Range to include the Denver metro area. But we do pride ourselves on our rural surveillance abilities. The cool thing about doing surveillance is that no two surveillance cases are exactly the same. Sure, there are similarities, but there are more differences from one case to the next, and that helps keep it more exciting. Now, if you do a lot of rural cases, the challenges are always increased exponentially. If you are doing metro type cases, you will find yourself going to the same grocery stores, driving the same main streets, and you start to really get to know certain areas of the metro or the city where you work really well. Rural surveillance is a bit different though. Sure, you may follow people to the same small town grocery store, convenience store, hardware store, places like that if you work in certain counties, but the main street out in the country is not like the main street in the city. In fact, what you will find many times is that your subject's route to get to town will not be a straight line from A to B, but it will zig and it will zag across the country as they drive past fields that they may be farming or they have livestock at, family and friends' houses, and well, many times they just plain meander around the countryside. One rule you must learn quickly in doing rural surveillance is that rural folk don't move at the same speed as city folk. They are much more aware of their surroundings and they will sniff out a nosy PI quicker than a rattlesnake can bite one when he gets out of his car to stretch his legs. Now today's case study and lessons learned video is in a rural setting. In fact, I did a video a long time ago on this case, but the viewership was much lower back then, so I decided to do another quick video on this case, as this is definitely one of the craziest rural cases I have ever had. The setup for this case is in a very rural, very remote, and very hilly countryside area. The residence was located in a newer subdivision with some very large acreages, most in the 10 to 20 acre size, and most owners had horses, cows, and other livestock on their property. The subject residence in this case was about 10 to 15 miles from the nearest town. There was one road that went right past the subdivision, but there were several entrances to that subdivision. These type of newer rural acreage subdivisions are something that are cropping up all of the time here in Colorado. People want to get away from it all, but they want to have large houses and they want to have all the amenities and still have some neighbors. They are kind of like really small towns with 20 to 30 or so families. I had checked this residence out several times before going out on it. In fact, I had worked it by myself a couple of times and I failed miserably. I was constantly being approached by neighbors and always lost my subject when she left. Now, I had tried to get the client to let me use a second investigator the first time I got the case, but no luck. However, once I was able to show them in video and in photos how difficult it was, they relented and let me bring in another surveillance investigator. The subject of this case was a married female who had sustained injuries at work that rendered her unable to do even desk work, or at least according to her claim. She had leg injuries that allegedly kept her from even being able to walk more than a short distance or pick up anything over a few pounds. As I said, the residence was about 10 or 15 miles from the nearest town. The area was also very hilly and it was impossible to park anywhere close and watch the residence. The roads inside the subdivision were graveled and maintained by the homeowners, but the county road was an old dirt road, no shoulders to speak of, and it seemed to go on forever. I had located a position about three quarters of a mile away where I could park and I had some cover from an old sign and some trees. From this position, I could see the subject's residence, see her vehicles, and see when there was activity on the property, sort of, if I maintained visual with binoculars as much as possible. I tried to use my camera to watch the residence, but there was just too much going on around and the property was pretty big, so the binoculars were the way to go. It was just a lot easier to bring those up when I thought I saw something rather than try to focus in my camera. Then when I did see activity on the subject property, I could quickly set my binoculars down, grab the camera. 
it was too far away to really get a good face shot with the camera too. So I had to make sure that my video had good quality to identify clothing, hairstyle, stature, and things like that. Now when my subject went active, I was able to come in behind her at a good distance, about a mile back. Remember, I was parked three quarters of a mile away to begin with, and I was the opposite direction that we believed she would go. So my strategy was to let her get out on the main dirt road heading towards town. Then after she crested the top of the first hill, I would start my follow. From that point on, I was pretty much just following her dust trail in front of me off in the distance. Now, due to the extreme remote location, the other investigator was located about seven miles away. Out there in the hills, there was also no, I mean zero, cell phone signal. So we relied on handheld radios for communication. But even then, we still had huge challenges. Given the hilly area, the only radio communication we could have was very brief moments when I crested the top of a hill. So at the top of every hill, I got on the radio and I said, she's coming seven miles out or however far we were. I then went down the hill, so I never knew if the other investigator got the message or not. When I got a few miles away, I was finally able to hear the other investigator say briefly something like, got it. I'm all set. <laughs> what a relief. Now, it was only seven miles, but it was a dirt road. You don't drive those roads at 70 miles per hour. It was a long, slow follow, to be sure. Once the second investigator got eyes on the subject vehicle, she was able to take over the follow, but then the subject always got on the interstate. Then she drove very high speeds. Now, the residence was located about 10 miles from the nearest town, but about 30 miles from the nearest city and to the city she went every time we followed her. We eventually got in the habit of the second investigator getting on the interstate in front of her and then trying to follow for a good distance from the front as I covered the rear position. We definitely had to get quite creative. Now when she got to town, she usually slowed down a bit, which was quite helpful for us. That first day we followed her to a competitor of her former employer and guess what? Yep, she was working there. We later found out she worked there part-time just a few days a week, but it still made for great video evidence. We had covered that case about 10 times, folks. It was amazing. The setup was perfect, and our plan worked flawlessly for the most part. She was never suspicious. We followed her to the grocery store a few times. Got tons of video there. We followed her to families' houses and got even more video. We followed her to work several times. We even had followed her to a feed store where she purchased some pretty large bags of feed for her animals. We got video at a distance at her residence as she fed and tended to her horses, her cows, her chickens, you name it, she had it. It was truly amazing how much evidence we got. Then the last day of surveillance, the most amazing thing happened. We went out just like any other day and set up just like we always did. Shortly after sunup, here she comes. She takes care of the animals. Then she gets in her vehicle and heads to town. Her routine was like clockwork, always dependable. She headed to town and did some shopping, stopped at the feed store again, then she headed off into the country. We figured she was taking a new route home, but boy, were we in for a surprise. We followed her as she drove and she drove and she drove for what seemed like forever. Finally, she stops at a farmhouse. After about an hour of driving, she parks, gets out of her car, then walks over to a barn area where there are a couple of other folks. They stand and they talk for a while, maybe 20 minutes, then they start walking around to the rear of the barn. We noticed there were a lot of cattle pens there with quite a variety of farm animals, cows and bulls, yes, there's a difference, horses and even llamas and alpacas. These exotic types of farm animals are quite popular in some areas here. We could see that she was walking and talking with the other two folks as they appeared to be examining the animals in the pens. Then she walks back around to the front of the barn and heads over to her vehicle. We figured she was all done, so we get ready to follow. We were set up at a good distance away, about a half mile either way up the road, so the plan was whoever she started driving towards would quickly get in front of her and speed away, then the other would come in behind. This is a tactic we use often in these situations. Then we sort out the details as mobile surveillance progresses. So we got in position and we waited. Then we waited. And then we waited some more. Then we thought we better make sure she was still there, so I did a drive-by. Now you won't believe what I saw. 
As I was driving by, I saw she had backed her vehicle up to one of those pen areas. I pulled over as discreetly as possible. I grabbed my camera and I started shooting video. Here comes one of the guys she was talking to leading a small baby alpaca over to them. I was like, no way. As he got closer to our subject, I saw her smiling. And then she quickly bent over and she picked up that little alpaca and placed it into the rear of her vehicle. I could hardly contain myself. My other investigator is like, no way, as I'm explaining what is happening. I would estimate that that animal probably weighed about 75 pounds. I got my video and I moseyed away from there as quickly as I could without drawing attention to myself. We reset up our positions and then waited for her to leave. After a few minutes, here she comes. Our follow back to her residence was slow, as she now had a passenger on board. When we got to her residence, we got even more great video as she unloaded that little baby alpaca all by herself, showing no signs of difficulty whatsoever. But wait, it's not over yet. The best part is still to come, folks. Shortly after delivering the alpaca to the homestead, she left and she headed back to town again. We followed her just like normal. She went to the feed and seed store again and left with several large bags of stuff. She then was back en route to the residence, but at a faster pace. As we arrived at the residence, the other investigator sees that she pulled over at a driveway entrance. Now she has a locked gate there, like most of those acreages, so we knew that she had to open that gate first. The other investigator pulls over and starts getting video. She gets video of the subject as she opens her large gate, then walks over to the mailbox to check the mail. As she is grabbing her mail, the other investigator notices she starts looking over at her and her vehicle. Then suddenly she starts walking back towards her vehicle with the biggest limp you could ever imagine. The other investigator had a white SUV type of vehicle that was similar to what a lot of those rural route mail carriers drive. So she was pulling up slowly to each mailbox along the road as if she was the mail carrier while she was shooting video. This strategy we use often and did on several instances on this case as well. Then suddenly the subject realized after she got her mail from her mailbox that the mailman had already been there that day. After about 10 days of surveillance, she finally caught on. Needless to say, we called it a day, closed the case down, and the client was ecstatic to say the least. Hey, here are two more videos that I made just for you. Thank you so much for watching and supporting the PI Guy channel. And remember, folks, remember, folks, stay safe out there.